So we started talking about discontinuous Galerkin methods and I've released the first assignment. Now this is a, a bit of a, a larger assignment than usual, so I'd like to spend a video to talk about it and talk about the details that might not be very well specified in the text. Uh, so first of all, what's the objective of this assignment? Well, you're going to code a one-dimensional discontinuous Galerkin method. And it's going to involve the solution to a hyperbolic conservation law. It's a very simple hyperbolic conservation law. It's the simplest hyperbolic conservation law. It's, it's simply uh, the time derivative of phi plus the spatial derivative of the flux of phi uh, being equal to zero. So I immediately see a mistake in the document here. Of course, uh, number one should have a spatial derivative on the flux. And for the simplest case, we choose as a flux simply the solution phi itself. And so you can think of this as an advective um, equation, uh, an advection equation, where we have an advective velocity pointing to the right with a unit value, so a value of one. So we're going to construct a discontinuous Glöcken method with an upwind flux. And we've come across upwind fluxes before, but then we didn't talk about finite element methods. We talked about finite different methods. And for finite different methods, well, we have upwind fluxes, we have downwind fluxes, we have central different methods. And so, so those terms are, are quite uh, familiar uh, in, in finite difference literature. Uh, but now we see that also in finite element methods, they, they, they pop up, and then for discontinuous Galerkin methods. Now we saw though for the finite difference methods that the upwind flux uh, had um, good stability behavior, but poor convergence behavior. Uh, it was a, an unconditionally stable method. Uh, we got okay solutions always, uh, but as we started to refine our mesh, we saw that the error only decreased with a, uh, an order of h, right? With the order of the mesh size, as opposed to h square or h cube. So it's a first order method. And so one of the things that we're going to see in this assignment is whether that's a, a property of upwind fluxes by, by nature of, of, well, them being upwind or whatever, uh, or if that was something that had uh, more to do with the finite difference method, uh, so the up and flux specific for finite difference. Yeah? So that's one of the learning objectives here. Um, now let's go a little bit more into the, the details of the, uh, of the model setup. So we have our simplest hyperbolic conservation law, only one spatial dimension, also one time dimension, so I suppose uh, technically it would still be a, a two-dimensional problem. And we'll treat the time domain with a finite difference time stepping, uh, stepping scheme, and we'll treat the spatial domain with a discontinuous Galerkin method. Now the flux function is equal to the, the solution itself, phi. Um, and here we have uh, it written out just uh, as uh, the differentials as subscripts. And again, this is a, an advection, uh, advection equation with an advective speed of plus one. So that's just a partial differential equation. Of course, we have to supplement this with boundary data, uh, boundary data in the sense of boundary conditions and in the sense of initial conditions. And since this is a hyperbolic uh, conservation law, there's a directionality to the information, right forward in time, and in this case to the right in the domain, meaning that we have to have an, in, an initial condition and a boundary condition uh, on the left domain, left part of the domain. So that's what we're specifying here in 4, 5, and 6. And there's going to be three different types of initial conditions. And they will all look slightly differently. Um, I think I illustrated them in this figure here, yeah? So the first one is a step function. The second one is a hat function. And the third, one, the third initial condition is a sort of a sine wave. And I have the explicit definitions uh, written up here. Now, in all cases, uh, the boundary condition on the left is going to be equal to zero. Right? So also for the step function, uh, it's important to realize that also at this, uh, this lower, uh, the lower left node in our spatial domain or a spatial mesh, uh, you would have a zero value. Uh, so the initial condition does not satisfy the boundary condition, but after an uh, infinitesimally small time step, uh, we would again uh, enforce the boundary condition. So we can already predict what the solution is going to look like as it advances advances in time 
uh, just by, by looking at uh, what this equation is supposed to do. It's an advective equation moving information uh, purely to, to the right uh, at a velocity of, of, of 1. So in, in time what we'll see is that our initial condition is transported uh, to the right. Yeah, so uh, after a time of 0 0.25, uh, this, this step function, this block, has moved to the right uh, by a, a distance of 0 0.25. Yeah, and it's maybe a bit uh, more clearly illustrated for the other two examples, yeah? for the hat function here and the sine function here. So these are the exact solutions. Yeah? That's already important to realize. You, you know the exact solutions. Um, you know what the solution is supposed to do. Uh, so later on, you'll, you'll have to also evaluate the quality of, of the DG method, uh, for which you need to uh, compare with the exact solution. Well, this is the exact solution. That's just a, a translation of the initial condition. Now, why did I pick these three initial conditions? Well, and I'm, I'm also specifying this in the text, but if we look at these initial conditions, then we see that they have three distinct characteristics in terms of their smoothness. Uh, the first initial condition, the step function, well, it's, it's clearly non-smooth. It has a discontinuity. Uh, so we, we call that a, a C minus 1 function. Uh, well, why minus 1? That's because we call a continuous function, like the one in the middle, the head function, we call that a C0 function. It has a zero, uh, zero order uh, smoothness. And so a discontinuous function is then called a C minus 1 function. We have C0 function, a head function, uh, and then we have the sine function that re represents a C1 function. Um, and the C1 function means that not the function itself is smooth, or not only the function itself is smooth, but also the first derivative of the function uh, is, is smooth, or is continuous, I should say. And so the, uh, this, the C the C set of functions, C0, C1, C2, that says something about the continuity of the function and its derivatives. So here we have three different functions that each fall into a different class of uh, order of continuity, either discontinuous, uh, C0, or C1. Now, I think that's already interesting um, in, because we're dealing with a discontinuous Gelökin method, so how do discontinuous Gelökin methods uh, methods treat discontinuities. Are they particularly good? Are they, are they actually not, not quite as good? But what I also think is very important to realize, and we'll see that as a result, well, we should see that as a result of, of your implementation here, is that you will get different convergence behavior for different initial conditions. And I won't go into the details, I want to, you know, to figure that out yourself. Um, but the thing that I, I, I want to teach with that is, is that it's, it's really not, not only the method itself that dictates the convergence. Right? So uh, right here I'm saying that upwind difference, uh, upwind fluxes for a finite difference method, for a finite difference formulation, uh, are a, a, a first order method. And that's definitely true. But um, it's not just the method that dictates the order of convergence. Um, also, the solution itself uh, limits a convergence order. And we'll see uh, that precisely for these uh, different uh, examples of initial conditions that um, some of the solutions converge better than others. Uh, so some of the solutions of your discontinuous Gelöken method converge uh, better or at a higher rate to the exact solution. And that, that's going to depend on this, this order of continuity. Yeah, so the, the takeaway message from that is going to be that uh, you, are, you, you learn to appreciate that it's not just the method itself that dictates convergence, it's also really the quality of the solution or the, the characteristics of the solution. Okay, so now I'm giving you here a discontinuous Gelökin method. And I think that's most of what I want to talk about in this video, just uh, to give some uh, background as to why I, I, I'm giving you these formulations. Okay, so equation number seven. In the last video, and it's been a while since I recorded that, so I kind of have to scratch my memory here, um, we came up with sort of a general expression for a discontinuous Gluck method based on a hyperbolic conservation law. Um, 
This equation here, equation number seven, is already specific for the one-dimensional case. Yeah, so let me let me first start off here by uh, kind of addressing the differences and, and how I come up with equation number seven from the equation that we we derived in class. So let's see. Um, okay, well, luckily I still have this one right here. So this was the general form. And if I'm being specific here in my integration, then we found that this was an integration over the element k volume. This was also an integration over the, the volume. And then we had an integration over the element boundary. Now, just as a quick recap or recall, uh, how did we end up with this equation? Well, we started with the original um, hyperbolic conservation law, right? something like this. And we multiply by a test function, but we can only do this per element. We only do this per element because of the lack of continuity across elements. Uh, so we do we multiply it by a test function and integrate and only on the element. And then we did integration of parts on the, the flux term, this term. And again, right, uh, this was a typo here. There has to be an x over there. Yeah, so that's the divergence theorem in 1D, in the assignment, and here more generally. Uh, so you do the divergence theorem integration by parts, and that's how we obtain the minus sign here. And then you get the integral of the flux dotted with the gradient of the test function here. Yeah. And, and by virtue of the integration by parts, we now also get a boundary term. And that was this term. So if we compare that to equation 7 in the document here, then we can recognize the first two terms from here, right? We have... Uh, Integration over element domains, time derivative of phi multiplied by v, and then f of phi uh, dotted by the gradient of v. Well, that's that's the same thing as, as what we're seeing here, uh, albeit here it, it's in, in 1D, right? So time derivative, uh, spatial derivative integrations over elements, and here I'm summing over all elements. So how about this last term, this boundary term over over the element um, boundary. So in the one-dimensional case, an integration over a boundary is relatively straightforward. So suppose this is our element domain in 1D, and then this combination of these two is, uh, or the combination of these two is, is what we define to be the boundary. So I'm not sure what's the nicest way to write this. I'll just leave it as a drawing. So an integration on this on this boundary partial k, well, in, in, in integration on the boundary in 1D is, is just a point evaluation, right? So an integration on this boundary is, is going to be the same thing as simply uh, the value of f um, phi plus phi minus dot n times v evaluated, and yeah, that's why I have to change this notation a little bit here to be a bit more specific. Let's call this one x1 and this one x2, so that uh, partial k is actually going to be, if you want to write this uh, nicely, it's going to be the set of x1 and x2. So now our integration over that boundary is going to be the sum over the set of, of these guys, and it's going to be then that expression in the integral evaluated at these two points, right? So we're going to get this one plus f phi plus phi minus, and this should be hats, right? We're, we're get back to that in a second, dot n v x2. Okay, uh, so what, what, what was up with these hats again? Well, we have a true flux function. That was this function. That's the, the real flux function. That's just a physical flux. So that, that dictates the, uh, the, the physics and, and how our equations look, um, or how our original equations look, the partial differential equation. But now we also have this numerical flux here. And that we introduced this concept of a numerical flux because well, the flux became a little bit ambiguous on these... Uh, these boundaries where we had a discontinuity. Do we take the flux of the value on the one side or the flux of the value on the other side? Uh, so that, that's an ambiguity. We have a choice there uh, by, by nature of the discontinuous Kluken method. And the choice that we'll make is, is what we call the, the numerical flux. And different choices lead to different methods. And I'll get back to this in, in future videos, of course. 
So now we have this integration uh, simply written as uh, the sum over these boundary nodes. Um, what's up with these normal vectors? Uh, well, clearly on the, the left boundary, a normal vector is simply going to be equal to a value of minus 1, and on the right is simply going to be a, a value of plus 1. And so we get uh, um, minus this one plus the second one. And that's how we end up with this expression. So then I, I should talk about um, my notation here with left and right. And I, I hope that from this drawing it's already rather obvious, uh, but just to make this a little bit more explicit. Now, we have, of course, an element here also neighboring this, this element that I drew, and one here to the right as well. And on each one of these nodes, we have the basis functions defined twice. Yeah? We have a basis function here from the element on the, on the left, and we have a basis function here from the element on the right. And the whole point of the discontinuous Glöcke method is that these values do not have to be the same, right? These basis functions are disconnected, discontinuous. So the evaluation here, the plus and the minuses, these in 1D can simply be written as, uh, as left and right values, right? So I can, rather than plus and minus, I can here say uh, left and right. Then I should be a little bit careful about this v, because also, of course, the test function is going to have two definitions. Well, we obtained this, this boundary from an integration by parts on the element volume here. So the, the expression for v that I should be getting, uh, or the value for v, v is going to be the, the interior value, right? It's going to be the, the, the v corresponding uh, to this, this k, because that was also the v that uh, this the original integration uh, corresponded to. Yeah, so for my evaluation here on the node x1, uh, I'm going to have to deal with v right. Yeah, so that would be this one. And for the, the second one, uh, I have to deal with uh, the, 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 the node x2. I have to take also again the interior value. So that's going to be left. And that's, I hope, precisely what I wrote here. Yeah, so... Uh, Rather than writing x1 and x2, I have partial k left and partial k right, but of course that's the same thing. Okay, so that's um, that's the one-dimensional version of the expression that we came up with in the last video. Now in here, I haven't specified yet what f hat is going to be. Uh, that's still left to the numerical analyst. And that's what I'm specifying below that text. So only after this, this definition am I going to specify my choice for numerical flux and my choice for time discretization and my choice for uh, spatial discretization in terms of polynomial order. And so as it says in the text, uh, we're actually going to consider two different types of um, polynomial orders, linears and quadratics. And so not only do we have uh, this, this case of the linear uh, elements here, and we might also have we will also have a case where our elements look more uh, like uh, this, right? That's a big boy drawing. Okay, so that's uh, our central element. And then, of course, our neighboring, our neighbors would still be, well, they, they would have the same basis functions, the same shapes, but again, this continues, right? So these are not connected. Okay. 
So on the top here, we have the linears, and on the bottom, we have the quadratic. So these are the basis functions that you'll be using in this assignment. So for the numerical flux, we're going to be using this upwind uh, expression, the upwind numerical flux. What does that mean? Well, from the physics, we know that information travels from the left to the right. It means that the left side is the upwind side. So intuitively, it makes sense that whenever we, we struggle to define our numerical flux due to these discont or our flux due to these discontinuities, and that's why we're introducing these numerical fluxes. But it makes intuitive sense that at those points, we're actually going to be using the upwind information because we know up the information travels uh, from upwind to downwind. So at each one of these locations, when we're not entirely sure which one we want to be using, uh, well, let's use the upwind one. Yeah, so that, 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 that's what it means for this flux to be, to be upwind. That we're, um, the f hats are not going to be functions of phi left and right, but in this case, because information is traveling to the right, it's only going to be a function of phi left. Now that's the upwind, uh, the upwind degree of freedom. Yeah, okay, I think I'm getting into that here. Okay. And because we know that the, the true flux is simply equal to, uh, to the variable phi, that means that actually our, our upwind flux is, is really quite simple in this, this one-dimensional case of, uh, well, the simplest hyperbolic problem, hyperbolic conservation law that you can think of. We simply get f hat is equal to phi left. And that's all. So that's what we would have to, sp to specify now in this boundary integration and hence in these evaluations right here. Yeah, so this, this would simply be the same thing as phi left. And this is also going to be phi left. Now note that these phi lefts are not the same values, right? The, the, here we're doing an evaluation at x1, so phi left is going to be this value. Whereas here we're doing an, an evaluation at x2, and then phi left is going to be this value. I hope that is clear. Okay. And then lastly, we're using a crank nicholson finite difference scheme. Um, honestly, that's always my, my go-to finite difference scheme because it's, uh, it's the easiest scheme that's second order. Um, you can use uh, upwind and downwind schemes. Uh, forward and backward Euler uh, time stepping methods. Um, those are all first order and then most higher order methods become uh, rather complex rather quickly. But Crank Nicholson is a, is, a, is a second order method that's very easy to implement. So when, when I'm interested in certain convergence characteristics of uh, at least order two, then I, I use Crank Nicholson. And I'm specifying later exactly how we implement the Crank Nicholson method. And what you're going to need, though, is the mass matrix and a sort of a stiffness matrix. I, I suppose we have to be a little bit careful in our, our nomenclature here. This is not the stiffness matrix that we, we, we see in linear elasticity or even for a Poisson problem, right? And then we have the derivatives on both slots here. Now we get this sort of this asymmetric term. We have a derivative on the second basis function and not on the first one. Well, that's, that's of course, because... Um, if we now work out this equation, you know I'll, I'll actually do that right here. So um, in the 1D case, we have an integral over k of d dt of phi times v minus the integral of, well, the flux of phi, well, we know for our simple example problem that is simply phi times the derivative of v, again, integrated over k, then a sum over all elements. And on the, the boundary, we had this evaluation of um, minus uh, phi left v right evaluated at partial k left plus phi 
left v left evaluated at partial k right and that's what we just ended up with so once we substitute a finite difference time stepping scheme in here um, this ends up being something of the form of um, phi times phi so we get something along the lines of uh, phi n plus 1 so or maybe phi uh, t plus delta t minus phi t divided by delta t and if we substitute that in here uh, then we actually get an integration over well some 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 function of phi be it in a, in a future time or in the past time multiplied by a function v and that's what our mass matrix is going to give us right so that's the basis function multiplied by the basis function now and now i hope it's clear that this this uh, stiffness matrix is, is simply uh, the basis function times the derivative of the basis function because we have phi times the derivative of v so those are the two ones that we need to treat these volumetric terms we have the mass term and the stiffness term and here again we have illustrations of the basis functions that i would like you to use um, now, don't worry about numerical integration or any of that. Uh, we, we have very straightforward definitions of m and k, dependent on, on uh, the index i and j. And I have here already very clearly specified for you how I would suggest for you to uh, define your, your numbering. Uh, so we have also an n1 and n2, n2, n1, n2, and n3. And you can simply carry out these integrations by hand. And there's nothing uh, tricky uh, here. It's a one-dimensional integration of, well, at, at worst case, uh, a quadratic by a quadratic. And yeah, I think we can all do that. Um, so, yeah, that's what I would suggest, that you carry out these integrations by hand for these two element types. And that gives you uh, a 2 by 2 matrix for the linear basis function and a, a 3 by 3 matrix for the quadratic basis function uh, for both the mass and the stiffness matrix. Okay, once you have those two matrices, um, we're going to have to assemble the global stiffness matrix. Yeah? We, we, these two matrices uh, correspond to the, uh, the element. Um, for this assembly into the global stiffness matrix, um, well, that's actually remarkably straightforward for a discontinuous Gulerkin method because we have no coupling among uh, the different elements for these two uh, integrations, right? So the coupling comes in uh, over the boundary. This is what couples the elements. Uh, this is purely element interior. There's no coupling uh, of the basis functions from one side to the other. And that means that if we want to assemble the global stiffness matrix, we can simply copy each of these matrices without any form of overlap. And so normally you have to be very careful that you sum the right values. Uh, you sum the, the, the values correspond to the right nodes. We don't have to be careful about that at all. We, we simply copy and paste uh, these matrices to the, uh, to the location of, of their nodes in the matrix. Yeah? And that's actually particularly important once you want to solve extremely large scale problems, because then uh, this kind of uh, checking whether something has been filled in already um, starts to be very, very dangerous. And especially dangerous if, if two processors try to fill in the matrix at the same time, right? So if you have uh, parallel implementation, so then you can get into trouble. But for a discontinuous Gulerkin method, at least at this stage, uh, we, we don't have any issues like that. We can simply copy our element local stiffness matrix into the right spots. Okay, well, at that point, we have a block diagonal matrix. Um, there's no element coupling, uh, coupling involved, so that, that's not going to leave us with a, a well-posed problem. We can't solve that. There's no trans transformation of, of, of information. Um, we somehow have to couple the solution from element to element. And well, that's precisely what those two remaining terms uh, are for. Uh, so that's what we're doing here in step number three. And that's why I'm, I'm giving a little bit more detail of, uh, of the, the numerical flux that we're interested in, right? The upwind flux. So that's what we talked about now as well. Um, and then I'm changing the equation that we have into the one that we're seeing right here, equation number 10. 
Um, so that's that's also what we derived already, if I'm not mistaken. That should be the same one as what we have right here. Uh, but then I'm telling you that that corresponds to adding this matrix in this fashion. And I, I was getting some emails that that was a little bit confusing. So I'll uh, try to explain that in a bit more detail. So what we did so far is we, we copied and pasted our element stiffness matrices into the, the global matrix. And then we got this block diagonal matrix. Something like this. Suppose that we have three elements. Now we have these three elements. And our nodes... Um, it doesn't matter. Be, uh, yeah, let, let, let's make, let's talk about the difficult case here. Let's talk about the quadratic case. We have these degrees of freedom. So how many? Uh, how, how large is our global stiffness matrix right now? Well, we have three elements. Each have each has three degrees of freedom. Uh, so we get nine degrees of freedom in total. And our block element stiffness matrices would look. Like this, right? The three by three matrices. And now we're trying to, to add these missing integrants. We call these are integrants, right? Even though they look like point evaluations, and they are point evaluations, they, they originate from an integral. So we're adding these integrations. Let's consider these two nodes. For this element, this node is partial k right. So on partial k right, what I have to do is I have to add, let, let's, let me also introduce a little bit of a, a global numbering here. A one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I have to add here phi left times v left. Phi left is simply equal to n three at this point. Let me call this uh, x zero, x one, x two, and x three. I'm not writing too small. So we get uh, phi left is equal at, at point x1 is going to be equal to our our third basis function. Also evaluate at x1. And, and that, that's the case simply because these are um, uh, interpolatory uh, basis functions, right? All the other basis functions are zero at this location. So the value of phi on the left hand side or of this node is always simply going to be equal to the value of the basis function at that location. Uh, v left is also going to be equal to n3 at x1. Okay, so that's that's relatively straightforward. So what does that mean? Um, well, we're adding plus n3 times n3. Or maybe I should be uh, uh, slightly more careful here. Um, Of course, if we're multiplying our basis functions by coefi weighting coefficients, then, then we would get phi, the weighting coefficient of phi 3 multiplied by the basis function 3 at xi. And similarly here, we have the weighting coefficient v, the third one, multiplied by n3 at xi. So the contribution that we're trying to add is plus phi hat coefficient number 3 for phi times n3 at xi times v hat at n3 at xi. Well, we're designing our basis function such that we have ones here for our basis function. Right? Nodal basis functions. So actually what we have here is simply... 
is simply the third coefficient for phi and the third coefficient for v. And that's what we're trying to add. So in terms of the matrix equation, that is simply saying, well, we're going to add 1 to the location 3, 3. Yeah, so we're adding 1 here. Okay, good. So how about this one? Right, The same node, but now the integration from the second element. Yes, that makes that the left boundary. Well, we have phi left times v right. So what we're adding is phi left. That is going to be, again, phi 3. Right, so the left, uh, the left value at this node is still going to be phi 3. But times v right, well, v right is now going to be the, the fourth coefficient. And sorry, I'm writing a plus, but this should be a minus, because we had a minus here. Now that's the one that we're doing right now. We're doing the left boundary. Yeah, so now I have to introduce a minus 1 at location 3, 4 in my matrix, or um, 4, 3. Um, the phi's are, are going to be, uh, the, the v's are going to be the rows, and the phi's are going to be the columns. So you get a minus 1 over here. And that's everything that's going on in, 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 in this node in terms of these additional integrations. And the next integrations that we're going to have to add are, are either here, here, or here. Which means that we have no other addition uh, to any one of the degrees of freedom involved in this node. And that's why I'm saying we have zeros here. And this is our upwind flux that we're trying to add on top of our matrix. Yeah, so that's what I'm illustrating here on the figure 3b. And let's talk a little bit about uh, boundary conditions because, well, okay, I, I hope it's clear that the same trick applies to this node, right? So we get plus 1, minus 1, overlaid right here, 0, 0. And how about our last node, this one? Well, there's really no, nothing special going on here. Uh, we're trying to do the same integration. Uh, we have the, the, the third element, so node number x3 is going to be the right boundary. On the right boundary, we're trying to add the left value multiplied by uh, the left value for, for v. Well, what's that going to be? Well, that's going to be uh, this degree of freedom for phi and this degree of freedom for v. Right? So we're adding... Uh, the coefficient phi number 9 multiplied by the coefficient for the test function v number 9. And well, that's what we're adding. That's, that's really just all it says right here. Yeah? So we get a, a plus 1 over here. How about the first node? Well, um, if you see a certain pattern here, then you would say, uh, well, that's actually going to be equal to 0, right? We have zeros here. 0 here. So you would also add a 0 here. Uh, that's true, uh, but we have to be a little bit careful with our boundary condition definition, right? So uh, um, these are just the integrals. Uh, after we've performed all the integration, uh, we're trying to also specify essential conditions. And the way that we specify our essential conditions is by crossing out rows and columns. That's so what I'm talking about right now is the boundary condition that we, we specified right here. Yeah, that at, the, at the position x is equal to 0, we always have a 0 value. Uh, so the way that you would perform that is that after you've done all of this, after you've uh, uh, introduced the mass matrix, the stiffness matrix, uh, the, the, the element coupling by means of uh, this upwind flux, after you've done all of that, what you're going to do is you're going to cross out this row, going to cross out um, well, there's different ways of doing this. I kind of leave it up to you if you have a better idea. Uh, the very the, the easiest way to do this is, is by crossing out just this, this row and replacing whatever is in here. Um, so you're going to set all of these to zero, zero, zero. Well, these ones are already zero, right? So that's fine. Um, then you're going to set the one over here. And in your force vector on the right hand side, uh, well, you would have to specify a zero. And I guess that we, our force vector is going to only involve our initial condition. 
Yeah, maybe for the step function, that's not going to be zero. So you would have to specify manually that the first node in your force vector, so we have the matrix multiplied by a solution vector, phi hat, is equal to our force vector, f. Uh, so you would have to set a 1 here, a 0, 0. And then you would have to specify, well, a 0 right here, right? Because that's our bound condition. That um, the value of phi at the leftmost node, well, that's exactly going to be equal to phi 1. But that's going to be equal to 0. Well, that's precisely what this line of multiplication now says, right? 1 times phi 1 is equal to 0. Okay, then I think uh, we went through most of this. All that's left right now is the time stepping, and um, I, I don't think I, I want to go into that too much. Um, I encourage you to, to look this up uh, yourself if, if you're not familiar with this, uh, but I'm, I'm straightforwardly giving you right now or right here um, what the, that the implementation of the crank nicholson would look like uh, given that you have M and given that you have K. Uh, I hope I didn't say this incorrectly. Um, so we're separating M and K, right? That, that's what we need according to these, uh, this equation right here. And M is simply the, the mass matrix defined by adding this element mass matrix right here. So this would be, this would, this would be precisely what your mass matrix is going to look like. And K is going to be the combination, so this K right here, is going to be the combination of these element stiffness matrices assembled in the same way, but then overlaid with the, uh, the coupling. So, yeah, I implemented this a year ago, so I have to be a bit careful on the way that I'm saying this. Um, I suppose what I just said in terms of boundary conditions, you do that also after uh, you formulated this whole matrix. Yeah, because then you would have a matrix that's going to give you the, the, the solution at the new time step, t plus delta t, as a multiplication of a certain matrix defined right here, times the solution at the old time step. And in that matrix, so this final matrix multiplication, you only have to do this once. I, I think that's actually important to point out. This whole, multi this whole computation of m plus delta t divided by 2 times k inverse times m minus delta t divided by 2 times k, that defines a matrix, and you have to only define that matrix once. Yeah. So I think when I looked into people's code last year, I, I saw that people are trying to update this inside of their time loop. That's completely unnecessary, and it's going to be extremely expensive. So you don't want to do this inverse and matrix multiplication every time step. You can compute this matrix multiplication once and define that as your Crank-Nicholson time stepping method and matrix. And that's what you would use every time step. And in that matrix, you would perform this operation of, uh, of uh, crossing out the row, setting a one in the diagonal and uh, setting a zero on the right hand side force. Okay. Mm. And then the last thing is step six. That's where you're actually going to get your results um, in terms of an error, at least. Uh, and I want you to compute the L2 error. And the L2 error is actually defined as the pre and post multiplication of well, the, the null coefficients of the errors times the mass matrix. Pre and post multiplication with the mass matrix. Um, so that still kind of begs the question of how phi is defined. So I'm saying here phi is the solution vector of the interpolated exact solution. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, we have the exact solution from these figures, right? As we said, the exact solution is simply a translation of, of the initial condition. So you would interpolate this guy. Yeah? So uh, we have no we have nodally interpolated basis functions, both in the linear and in the quadratic case. So if you want to interpolate any function, well, then simply any one of these values of these coefficients here is going to be equal uh, to the value of the function that we're trying to interpolate at that location. So that should be relatively straightforward to implement. The one thing that's slightly tricky is that you have uh, uh, two coefficients corresponding to the same point, right? So you kind of have to uh, take that into account. Okay, and after you've done that, you can... Uh, 
evaluate the error and then I'm interested in, in seeing how the error converges uh, for uh, the different initial conditions and for the different polynomial orders. Um, and of course, I would like to also see some, um, some, some, some plots of actual solutions. Yeah, and I think that's, that's what I'm also saying here in the deliverables. Okay, um, so that's a relatively in-depth uh, discussion on this assignment. I, I hope this was useful and I, I hope this was clear. Uh, of course, you're very free to ask me uh, if, if you're, you're stuck, if you run into any issues. I think this is a pretty interesting assignment. I think it's actually worthwhile to implement stuff like this at least once yourself so you get a feeling for what's involved and you get a, a bit of a better understanding of, of how things behave. Yeah, it's, it's easy to, to read things in a book or, or hear uh, things about certain convergence orders or whatever, but once you start to implement these things yourself, you get a, a feel for what that actually means and if there's any, any limits to that or, or whatever. Yeah? So, um, well, good luck and, and looking forward to seeing what, what anyone, everyone comes up with. Okay. Thank you for your attention. See you in the next video.